And welcome to the second half of our special Independence Day broadcast on Plus TV Africa. Happy Independence Day, Nigeria. Despite glaring setbacks in many sectors, many optimists say, in spite of all, there is cause to celebrate as the country remains indivisible and insoluble entity in the last years. Yes, uh, though it has been a mixed bag of uh, three years of civil war, 30 years of military rule and 27 years of civilian administration, the country has survived it all with the current uninterrupted 21 years civilian administration. Tonight, we shall be beaming our searchlight on the security, education, health, youth demography and other relevant sectors. We will be joined by experts and opinion leaders who will do justice to the issues confronting these sectors and, of, of course, prefer ways out of them. I am Felicity Ezewike. And I am Osaogi Ogbon. All right, before we um, introduce our first uh, line of focus, I think it's fair. We just talk about what happened this morning where the president's speech has been eliciting a whole lot of reaction. Uh, somebody sent me um, uh, a recap where the president talked about um, the price of petrol. It's now fixed. It, uh, agitating or no agitating, yeah. we are going to be paying higher. Everyone's uh, eventually going to be Exactly. He, he made a um, comparison between uh, countries. People are now sending information showing that the minimum wage in these countries that comparison was made is much higher than Nigeria. It, it's shocking. And for me, I always wonder if, you know, thought, you know, was put into these um, 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 statements before they were made, uh, before, you know, these statements were put out there for the rest of Nigeria to, you know, look through. Um, did someone think, oh, what is the per capita income in Saudi Arabia? What is the minimum wage in Saudi Arabia? What is the minimum wage in some of all these countries before we start to compare how much the, you know, the price of petrol is in these countries? And it's, um, for a lot of Nigerians, they would say it's rather unfair, you know, to expect that um, with what we earn, with what, you know, our, our economy is like, we would be compared to um, a country like Saudi Arabia that is, you know, in, in a lot of ways better off, you know, than Nigeria. So um, many talking points, to be yeah. honest. I have an epistle of what I would want to say, but it, it worries me that the theme for this year is together when there is so much agitation across uh, borders, people are saying um, we're not happy with the way uh, things are. It, you know, I, I kind of wonder if that was the right um, stance to take when we've not had conversation about whether we want to be, you know, an indivisible uh, entity or we want segments just the way uh, we've discussed it. I watched analysts this morning here on Plus TV Africa talk yeah. about the fact that we're not practicing true federalism. We're not pra we don't have like a real structure that allows people to be participants in the process that um, leaders uh, it, used to lead them. It honestly feels like these are the statements that we must make every year on Independence Day. But um, when it's time to take the steps that will, of course, put us on the right track, that will make these statements come to life. Um, we never get to take those, you know, take those steps. If you, if you look back at the last 10 Independence Days, we've made very similar statements. It sounds like it is a broken record all over, um, over and over again. We talk about the same things, talk about corruption, talk about the educational system, talk about security and of course the war against insurgency, talk about our teaming youth population, talk about healthcare, it's the same thing over and over. But um, if you would wait till 2021 on Independence Day again in 2021, I'm very sure we would bring back these same same statements, but you would barely get to see any. And I'm not trying to sound um, oh, pessimistic, uh, pessimistic <laughs> you know, but you would barely see. I'm, 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 I'm speaking from 
what I have experienced in the last 10 years. You would barely see any very, very um, intentional moves to make a difference. Very intentional moves to ensure that, you know, when we are, you know, get into this same place in the next five years, um, we are in a better place. Um, and so these, you know, Independence Day speeches, you know, for a lot of Nigerians, um, it always comes with, you know, zero attitude. You know, they, 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 um, if you look through most of the comments online, most of the reactions to these things online, you would barely see any celebration. I remember um, yesterday evening, someone put out a post, um, or two days ago, I believe, um, saying, oh, Nigeria is going to be 60 um, in a few days. What are the things that you're excited about, you know, being a Nigerian? And the response... All well, through I, I unexpectedly, that there is it, so it much. Um, I woke up this morning and I put up a post about Happy Independence Niger. Uh, but uh, I know a lot of persons have some concerns about um, how we are as, as a people. Yeah. Uh, but there is still something to celebrate. Um, I would rather the theme for this year together is um, get towards. Uh, uh, together, we come to a decision as to how we are going to live for the next 60 years. For that sense of inclusiveness that he's, yeah. the president, you know, talked a whole lot about, the sense of people feeling that they're part of the uh, country and not just, you know, from one ethnicity. Yeah. It has to be a discussion yes. as to I... whether we want to remain together or we want to, you know, be in another way restructured, basically. I'm personally celebrating this Independence Day with every other person who still is in love and true love with um, Nigeria, who is still, you know, fully and from the bottom of their hearts in love with Nigeria, still passionate about where we want to be as a, as a country, still passionate about putting in what they can put in to ensure that we have a better nation. And um, I know there's a few people who have lost, you know, interest, who have lost hope, you know, who really yeah. don't care anymore. But uh, for people like me and I believe yourself and, you know, thousands we of people. We are of passionate others, about this country. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking. I mean, we need to show tough love. That's what they say. Yes. I am a proud Nigerian. I wouldn't want to be born anywhere always. else. So, again, happy independence, Nigeria. We'll start the conversation. It's not just going to be the two of us uh, talking in the studio. Uh, we will um, uh, be showing you a report put together uh, by one of our very own, Elsie uh, Godwin. Uh, she's taking a look at the youth demography uh, in Nigeria, making a comparison where we are at, what we are doing. She talks a lot about the youths in the early time and now. Let's see that report and we'll be back and introduce our guests to you. In the words of an Indian Asian teacher and philosopher, Chanaka, the world's biggest power is the youth. A youth in Nigeria is defined as anyone between the ages of 18 and 35 years. Nigeria, being the most populous country in Africa, sits on the top 10 list of countries with the largest population of this demography in the world. As Nigeria clocks 60 with more than half of her population in this age bracket, young people are expected to be economically and politically productive for the society to move forward. Despite the weight of gerontocracy in Nigeria, the Nigerian youth have been largely been active. They have uh, achieved you know, a lot more. They have contributed their own quota to the nation building. They have excelled in agriculture. They have done well in information technology. They have also done well in the creative industry. The youth are in the process. Uh, we're making effort, and I believe it's only a function of time where there's going to be, you know, what that shift. A quick glance at Nigeria's history clearly shows that those who fought for our independence were all youths. But in 2020, the idea of a youth leading this country sounds unimaginable. What has changed? The youths of 1960 were, or rather, are youths that I consider uh, that, that I consider privileged youths. These were youths that just inherited a Nigeria that was just independent. They inherited a Nigeria that had enormous opportunities. They inherited a Nigeria that its dollar could call its naira could compete with the dollar. It's never could compete with the pounds. It's never could compete with the yen. They inherited a Nigeria that its educational system was at the top of the pyramid. They, in fact, they inherited a Nigeria that was working. 
So you can't compare the youths of 1960 and the youths that are disadvantaged in 2020. The youth of 1960, like Chief Abafi Pai you know, Zeke, all of them, there were few who that were educated. There were plenty of opportunities that could go around, you know, fewer people. Rising up to this challenge on this year's 2020 International Youth Day, former President Olusegun Obasanjo, who became head of state in his early 30s, did not spare this subdued set of people. Form your own party, okay. manage it, run it, and take over. A quick flashback to pre-independence reveals that the nationalists in their 30s and early 40s took the bull by the horn, which current youths must take a cue from. If you look at the event of the last general election, of which I was an active player, you would see that there was a high influx of youths that came out in mass. Beyond taking over power and leadership, it is often said that the led have got even greater responsibilities for their behavior and impact on the society. The potential of Nigerian youths have been proven to be better maximized outside the shores of the country. Nigerian youths, against all odds, have consistently excelled in different works of life globally. From health to sports, science and technology, agriculture, telecommunication, and even more dominating is the entertainment industry. If they use their drive, come together, they will not support, they will not campaign and support corrupt people, bad government, they speak about it, against it, then they'll be able to have chance. Yes, they call us the future of the country every time. It's a generational statement. We need to understand that that future is now. As we celebrate 60 years of independence and prepare to launch the Vision 2050 agenda, we must begin to question the roles each and every citizen of Nigeria must play, most especially the youths, for a greater Nigeria. Elsie Godwin for Plus TV Africa. And thanks very much to Elsie Godwin for that report. Um, of course, uh, talking about the youth and Nigeria, where we are coming from, and uh, how much more uh, demands that the Nigerian youth have. Um, uh, joining us to, of course, have a conversation about this, uh, we have uh, uh, Gloria Chibuike. She is a youth advocate. Thank you so much for stepping in and for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Pleasure We're also going to be here. speaking with uh, John Sinabali, uh, the convener, Vision 2040. It's a pleasure to have you join us, Mr. Um, Abali. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, um, let me start with our in-studio guest. The comparison that was done in that report, youths in the past and youths today, say 60s, 70s, 80s, and what we have today, is the hope for the youth demography uh, in Nigeria 60 years on? I would say 100% yes. There is hope for, Niger for Nigerian youths um, because there's so much effort that is being put in right now. You know, Nigerian youths are doing a lot more than we used to do. It feels like we're all waking up. Everybody's trying to put their head somewhere. So I think there's hope, you know, I think there's hope, but they just need more encouragement. They need to feel like if they're making efforts that they're being heard. Yeah, and making efforts really. Um I, I don't know if you have something to say because I was. Yeah, I was. I was. I, I mean, when you're talking about encouragement, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, where, you know, what more encouragement they need. Um, first of all, you know, it's great seeing. I personally love seeing women because I've always been a low key advocate for women in politics and women uh, talking governance. And um, of course, so it's great seeing you um, in the studio. So, what more encouragement would you say that the youth need? In what way? Um, when it comes to encouragement, okay, I'm talking about the, the government because I think that's one of the biggest problems that the youths are having. That's one of the things they're complaining about. You know, proper, we don't have a um, proper education system, we don't have this, we don't have that. Now, when I mean encouragement, I mean the government being able to support these people. It's like, you see, we're making effort. How are you going to help us by making things easier for us? You understand what I mean? Yeah. I mean, let, let's speak to Mr. Johnson Abali now. Um, thanks for joining us once again. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm I, happy to be here. So. Yeah. Some people would, would describe Nigerian youth as lazy. 
um, lazy in the sense that, um, of course, if you compare them with youth from other countries like France, uh, South Korea, uh, the Philippines, and some of all these places that we, of course, get to see on TV every other you know, time, um, we don't have the same attitude here in Nigeria. Would you agree with that word used to describe Nigerian youth? Absolutely not. And there is absolutely no basis for that. I mean, why would you call a Nigerian young person lazy? lazy? I mean, how do you even contextualize that? You, how do you define lazy, really? Is it a kid who stays in the heat of the, of the African sun for two hours, is trying to close a sail of one such of water? Is that laziness? Is it a young kid who wakes up at 4 a.m. in the morning so that he can help the mom do some chores and help her get to the market before she comes back home and take care of her little kids and then is able to go back to school late? Is that laziness? Is it a young person who has to irk a living with the incredibly impossible situations they have to put up in a country like Nigeria? You know, sometimes when people just make some of these um, blanket statements and then they compare us with other people, the parameters for the comparison are usually very suspect. I mean, it's just like, uh, you know, before you guys brought us on, you were talking about uh, some of the things that the president said much earlier when he referred to uh, the pump price of oil and then other people were wondering, how do you take one small index of an entire big picture and then push it? That's, that's caricature. Caricature is taking a small part of something and blowing it out of proportion, all right? Saudi Arabia can afford to sell their fuel at 1,000, at 1,000 naira per liter. After all, the people minimum wage is 700,000 naira minimum wage in Saudi Arabia. In Nigeria, it's still 18,000 for because the 30,000 naira has not really been implemented across board. And that's essentially less than $100 by this particular administration's exchange rates. So what we are talking about, young Nigerians are not lazy. I don't see what the laziness is, all right? I mean, if you go out there, you see people irking a living, trying to do what they can with the kind of education, the slapdash education that they have been given. The education they get is not fit for purpose, does not equip them for real life, it's not entrepreneurship in any way, and there is nothing about any of the deal that they get from this government that positions them to make a living in spite of government. These young people still go on to make the best that they can with their lives. If, as a matter of fact, I think that young Nigerians can do even better without governments in their way. Because when they try to thrive, then you see people show up and make their lives a bit more miserable. You see, even take the uh, Shishu economic analysis of the demography between 40 and zero. These are young Nigerians who maybe didn't see the war. I mean, these people have endured in a, I mean, they, they live in a system that they have never seen worked. Except they've traveled abroad or have some opportunity to see some things online, they've never truly experienced what it means to live in a system that worked. Now, that is a profile of the mind of a young Nigerian. And who gave him that profile? I mean, these are, you're taking a country back from a, a group of individuals, gerontocrats, who were handed a functional nation and the toy the paths and the politism and ethnicity and greed and avarice, and then you expect the young Nigerian to rise up out of nothing and then create a miracle? How is that going to happen? You know, so, you see, I, 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 I get pissed off a lot when I hear about what people say about in Nigeria and then you compare them with other places. I mean, I have lived in the United States, all right? And there is a place called Oakland. You go to Oakland right now, you see black young people all living, moving around the street. They don't want to do anything with their lives. They either um, want to play football or go into rap and Mr. all of that. Mr. Abali, if all I right? may. The, 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 the funnel for success for them is smaller. And that is a country that gives um, education support. You can get a student loan, a robust student loan, the express repayment over 40 years, and they don't even start to collect that repayment until you get a job that pays you at least 15 Mr. Abali, if I year. may, please, now, if, if I may interject. With um, with a, with a, I, I don't think you can hear us. Can you hear us, Mr. Abali? I'm, 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 I'm just taking over all of this. I think um, I'm re I really need to uh, butt in. Deal in this whole arrangement. They always <laughs> get what's coming to them. Okay, um, I, I was going to lazy. follow up with Mr. Bali, but he seemed to have had uh, quite an, um, a, a, a long talk time. So I'm going to come to you of what he's saying, that opportunities a roundabout way that we don't have seem to have enough of that but from that report Elsie talked about this a, a, a guest in Elsie's report uh, Mr. Rahim 
Ajayi. Um, he talked about that, the fact that the youths have been largely active. And then um, Larry, in that same report, uh, believes that the youths are in a process of getting somewhere. Of what he has said and what you said earlier, we're 60 years today and counting. How much longer does the youth need to have to begin to make an impact in their time? Because remember that the people that we refer to, Obasanjo himself um, came in in his um, late or early 30s to the realms of power and he's been a very vocal voice since then. When we, nobody gave it to them, they took it. So when are we going to be ready to do that? Um, I would say that being ready is one of the problems that we Nigerian youths have. And I'm saying it in the sense that we, I said this the last time I had an interview and I said low self-esteem is one of the biggest problems that we Africans fight with, especially the youths. We feel like we can't do it. We know we're being told because, let's say for example, like for in the past years, okay, um, youths from 35 up, no, not down, but okay, let me say youths from like the 20s to 35 have been greatly absent in the government sector. Okay, and that's a problem because a lot of them are scared to go. They say, oh, no, well, you, you keep think talking about be them being scared. You are here today. You're mm -hmm. speaking. Are you scared? Must you even inspire? They say courage is not the absence of mm -hmm. fear. So are we going to say because we're scared, we're not given the opportunities, we're not going to come out and do what it is? For instance, the last election, so much for young people already um, mm -hmm. not too young to run. Mm -hmm. And then we have the situation where they were supposed to be a pact. They're supposed to come to a consensus to get one candidate. And you still saw the disarray that came out at the end of the day. No one wanted to step down. Is it a factor of what history has given to us? Or is it a factor of an intrinsic des um, um, rejection of the idea of I must do what I can for this country uh, to move forward? Or maybe the issue about our identity, would that be a better excuse than to say that the youths are not uh, encouraged, they're scared? You know, I I'll take your response and then we'll say the same thing to Mr. Abali. Like you said, am I scared? I'll, I'll start with that. I'm not scared at all, okay? If I'm scared, then I wouldn't be here. If I'm scared, I wouldn't decide to be a youth advocate or a youth counselor. You understand what I mean? But I think it's just a big problem with African youths to decide to brace up. But then we're doing our best, okay? A lot of us are coming into the society right now. A lot of youths are putting in so much effort. They're trying to be part of the society. It's not, they say, yes, the older ones, they wouldn't let us get into the, you know, into the system. But I think the problem is that most times when we get to that point, I wouldn't want to use the word bribed, because a lot of people, they say, oh, no, step down, you know, and, you know, to hold this money. And then you just move. You give up. You know, okay. we're not willing to make the sacrifices. We get to a point and we just give up. All right, let, let's bring Mr. Abali in quickly. I know uh, Osagio yeah, would have some question, but yeah. I still want your response to the question. I don't know if you got it earlier. Yes, I did. I got, I got your question about um, whether or not they're afraid. And, and again, I'm asking, how do you even measure scare? Afraid. Yep. I mean, you know, sometimes when you see youth, the, the problem sometimes I have with talking heads on TV is that when they mention the word youth, they're talking about the people in the upper crust of the society, you know, the up and over cosmopolitan young people who scored in the half a million uh, naira per term schools and all of that. So they consider those, those are youth. The, the Nigerian youth is actually on the street and those kids aren't afraid of anything. These are the people who will trek all the way through deserts in Libya and swim through oceans. They, they, they know it entails a lot of pain, but the pain is a price to go to Spain. They even will want to attempt it. I mean, when somebody comes to the point where he prefers a watery grave than to stay in this place and is ready to give it a go, many of the people who play football for Nigeria, many of them had to go through hell and high waters so that they were able to get a way to get to Europe and play the trade. And eventually when they break out, we start to, you know, come around you know, we are, we, we are, we are a fair weather country. We only show up when people eventually make it. All right? The same country that turned down Joshua, uh, Joshua, Anthony, Anthony, Joshua, the same country that shows up and says, oh, that's us. Huh? Why? Because it's beginning to bring in the laurels. That's the kind of people we are. And that, that crab mentality has to stop. You see, young Nigerians are not afraid to attempt big things. If, as a matter of fact, 
the real progress that we have made in the last 20, 25 years have been because of staff that young Nigerians take. Look at your economy. They are run by young Nigerians. You can't go to any corporations today, from banks to uh, blue chip companies, industries, or you count them. You discover that these companies are run by people who are younger than 40, many of them in their early 30s. And these are people bringing innovation and driving new things. I mean, look at your studio. Plus TV is driven yeah, essentially well, by need, youth. Mr. Now, the people don't want to let those young people have power. What are they afraid of? That the youth will mess things up? I mean, what is there to be messed up that has, that has already been messed up? You, 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 you got a picture. So that's clear. Young people are not afraid. In fact, as a matter of fact, I really think the government is afraid of young people organizing around a strong, powerful cause. Because, you know, when young people begin to come together, they know that that's a strong thing. And so they try to, you know, weaponize poverty so that they can keep them at their leash. And that's part All of the right. problem that we are having. Young Nigerians, I think that there is a gross mis underestimation of young Nigerians. Um, Mr. Bali, just, just before, before you come in, I'll tell you. Anything, literally. Uh, follow up on what you were saying, uh, just before my colleague comes in, I wanted to say that we, we are not blind to the fact that Nigerian youths are one of the most resilient, intelligent, all the positive things that come with it. But when we talk about, in this contest of Nigeria celebrating 60 years of independence, we're looking at particularly the area of governance and leadership. There seem to be a lack of adequate representation when it comes to the youth demography. And we are saying that, I mean, some persons, like in the reports that Elsie presented, that the youth demography is still in a process. And uh, we're saying 60 years on, the youths before now that took the rem and tried to grow Nigeria were still young, but they were able to do that in spite of the odds. So what is stopping us? We have so much opportunities. I like, I like to tell you a story. I mean, this story is in a public place, and I know that a lot of us are familiar with it, about Stalin. Stalin uh, once went to Congress, and then he took a chicken with him. And then he plucked out the feathers of the chicken live right there in front of Congress. And people were, you know, rethinking, you know, why they watch this chicken in incredible pain, obvious pain. And then after that, he let the chicken down and brought uh, chicken food in his hand and called the chicken. The chicken came back to eat off his hand. And then he said famously that that's how the people are. Strip them of everything and still they come to you for food. And that's exactly what's going on. Young Nigerians do not lack. They do not want a political favor or passion or desire to even rule. But the trouble is that the people who do not want young people in power has done so in such a way that young people would not have either the capacity, even if they have the will, there's no capacity to pursue. I mean, somebody has said, oh, there's uh, no too young to run deal that has been signed into the law. But how about the electoral law that deals with the question of funding and election finance? Because if you do not have a treasure trove, you cannot run for any office, even as small as that of a councillor in a local government work. Why is that? Because it has been hugely politicized and, financed and, and commercialized. That is the whole reason why you have the concept of the money back godfathers. And somebody is saying we're going to take away godfatherism. How do you strip godfatherism from a political process that entrenches it in its very fabric? I mean, there is no way you can run for office if you do not have at least half a million. I mean, even half a billion. I mean, 500 million naira. <laughs> Where is the young man going to get that? How many years do you have to work to raise that kind of money? So representation for a young person who is still looking for how he's going to get his next meal, where his next lunch going to come from, is laughable, to say the least. Right. So hold, the hold truth of the matter is buddy. that a young person has been stripped strategically of his capacity to genuinely compete in the political space. I, I want to ask now, you know, right from where he, he left off, um, former President Olusegun Obasanjo was someone that was also in that report advising the youth to form a political party, um, organize it, run it, and take over leadership. Um, do you think that is achievable? Um, and, and I want you to put in mind the um, clogs in the wheel with regards to running for politics or running for office in Nigeria, um, how expensive it is. Um, how, of course, there's a lot of you know, roadblocks here and there. Um, so do you think that is achievable with the current day Nigerian youth? Yes, very much achievable. I mean, it's all about, you know, we putting our minds to something and getting it done. During the um, not too young to run, you know, um, election period and everything, I don't know much about it. So I'm not going to say too much, but there's one thing I noticed, that when we Nigerian youths come together, 
and agree on something, we get it done. And the truth is, yes, financially, a lot of people are not well equipped. But if we put in the effort to start, there are people who would come out and support it. A lot of people supported that actual movement. There was so much to su support to it. Yes, we didn't win, but we don't have to give up. That's my point. My point is, we as Nigerian youths don't have to give up. We have to keep trying. It's not a crime to fail. It's not a crime. I know a lot of, I have friends who are youths who contested in their states and they failed. But guess what? They said, I'm contesting again. Yes, you spent that money, but you're trying to give back to your society. You're trying to be a different person. So it's just more about, let's put in the effort to do it. You know, and it's, it's all going to add up. There are a lot of young Nigerian youths who are doing so well. A lot of them, I'm sorry to say, don't know what they will use their money to do, so they're willing to invest it into people who they see that are willing to grow. Shouldn't be so tough. Johnson Abali, are you still with us? I am here. All right, so I, I want to you know, throw the same question to you. You, you um, started talking about Nigerian youth and, of course, getting into politics and how difficult it, it might be because of like, how expensive... Um, it is to run for office in Nigeria. So I want you to respond to former President Olusegun Obasanjo, who is um, advising Nigerian youth to form their own political party, organize it, run it, go through all the steps necessary, and see ways that they can take over office. If you were um, to advise on how that should be run, do you think that is achievable? Mr. Bali, can you hear us? Okay. okay, I think, I, I think we lost him to. for a bit there. Um, I, I don't know if you could respond to it while we wait to reconnect. Okay, like I was saying, like we can do it, okay? It just takes for us to come together and I think we're working towards it right now. I have a lot of youths that I'm working with. I've, I've come across, you know, a lot of Nigerian youths who are doing a lot to invest in their society. Even though most times they feel like they're not being appreciated. But I just think it's not about the appreciation. It's about the fact that you know want you're making this. Exactly. You're, you want to serve. Okay, I, I want to refer, I don't know if you watched the report earlier by Elsie. Um, part of it, part of uh, the comments that was made by one of the respondents was the fact that um, the, pe the young people that inherited um, Nigeria, as we were, and tried to build a democracy um, were privileged. And that the youths of today are disadvantaged. Mr. Bali um, alluded to it in his submission when he talked about the expensive nature of politics and, of course, the lack of opportunities that are there. But in spite of this, let's talk solution. In what ways can the young people in this country begin to be a bit more assertive when it comes to the issue of leadership in Nigerian uh, uh, politics? You know, one of the things I'm going to note is I think... Most times, the reason why it's like we Nigerian youths, when we want to go into politics, where it's like you're being pushed out, okay? I don't know if that word is right, but it feels yeah. like you're being pushed yeah, out. Obviously, you there, know there are I mean? a lot of obstacles, but it's said in spite of this. Exactly. Yeah. Now, it's like this. If you are contesting for something, you know, it's your first time. A lot of them, they make money. They say they want to contest for something. You run up to go to the highest level. You have to start little. You have to start to make that. You can be a counselor. You can go, you can be a local government chairman. These are things that Mira, are very- there is no money there. No, no you don't. That's, you <laughs> see, you there see. There is no money there. You, no, no, you I'm see. I'm just telling you what they will say. But the, that's the problem. The problem is we're too money conscious that we don't understand that we have to sacrifice to get to where you want to be. All the rich people that we see today, they have a story to tell. They just didn't jump on the money. So you have to work to get yourself to that point. You can't just wake up and say, oh, I'm a Nigerian youth, so I'm just going to go contest for House of Assembly. You don't know nothing about politics. I think there's also a lot of trust issues among um, young Nigerians. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it travels very far. Um, what I really hope is that the the things that divide us as Nigerians haven't eaten too deep into, you know, the young Nigerians, into the young, vibrant Nigerians. Um, if we can, I believe that if young Nigerians can still follow the advice of former President Lucia Gombasanjo, I don't think whatever youth party they form is going to charge 15 million naira for a ticket. 
Um, I don't think it's also going to have, you know, too many of those clogs, you know, to get into those positions as long as they truly believe. So, so let, me, let me use this analogy. Um, a couple of days ago, weeks ago, um, there's been a lot of conversation concerning what happened with the Big Brother Niger show. Um, a lot of people run away from it because they don't want to accept that we actually have the youth numbers to make the change that we need. Um, but um, when you bring based that Based on up, the votes cast, yes. yes. But, that was a no, huge no, conversation. The vote, yes. um, the, the attention that it pulls, the conversation that it pulls across the country, the amount of young people you see waiting at the airports to welcome their favorite housemates, that you would wonder where these people are when it's time to vote. Uh, so how um, can so, we, that, I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, but how can we pull ourselves together? That, that's, Maybe that's, really, you know, that's really um, where I'm I'm actually yeah. going to give an example from what you just said. This is, this is what I literally tell my friends every time we sit together. I said, if Nigerian youths can put in the effort they put in into programs like this, into reality, which is our reality, because you see them on the social network, they fight each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, like you said, these people come and they get to the airport. You have people packed out there waiting. So th my, 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 my question, my, my thinking, though, is... There is something about, we have very creative people. There's something about harnessing opportunity. Now, this is a gold mine of people whose attention, we know the kind of things that attract them. Isn't, it, isn't there maybe a creative way we could devise maybe a show that has to do with leadership and have young people come in, contest? It might not be, you know... One that of the things way that we I begin would, uh, to change gradually. It's a process. I'm gonna We're bring 60 in, years old yeah. and we still have I'm going to bring in Mr. Abali um, <laughs> next. But one of the things that I would also mention is that we have a problem with our attention span as young Nigerians. We sure. forget after three days. <laughs> we're passionate about something today. It is crazy all over social media. Three days later, we're done with it. Exactly. Once something new comes in, we're done with it. And in those three days, we have time to get distracted by whatever new information, whatever new story comes in. Um, Mr. Bali, um, welcome back. Um, I, I guess you can hear us now. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can. yes, we can, clearly. I'm, I'm asking about how you think it is possible that we run a young people's political party, according to the advice of former President Tulushego Obasanjo. Um, do you think it is achievable that we can actually create, or the Nigerian youth can create a young you know, a party for themselves um, that will be driven and organized and ran by them entirely to take over, you know, certain positions in government. Hello, if it's, uh, if what you mean is get young people active in politics, keep them away from the street, keep them out of trouble, but let them do something that you can more accurately call pseudo politics, then maybe that idea sounds nice. Because the truth of the matter is, the last election we just came out from, we had a youth political party. If as a matter of fact, they called it YPP, I think, Youth Political Party. But again, the problems are still fundamental. So even though they had younger candidates who were looking to run, you had the uh, former uh, deputy governor of the CBN, you had Felad Rotoye, you have uh, uh, the other guy, of the Shara reporter guy, you, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? So what happened there? That should give you an idea of the fundamental problem you have. The biggest problem young Nigerians have is poverty. And that is the very leverage that politicians have over them. Because, you see, if, if I want to split the vote, all I have to do is to make a provision for all of these young people and split the middle. If I split the middle, there is no way they can organize effectively among themselves because the fundamental needs, according to Maslow law, the needs for survival has not been taken care of. And a young person for any day, anybody who is in a survival mode, we, uh, we can't even have to think about it twice, we'll drop whatever political education you're asking him and we'll go for the money. It's the way it works. Poverty has been weaponized in such a way that gives politicians the ability to control the young vote. Let me be honest with you. If you want to win election in Nigeria, you must control three pillars. The political pillar, religious pillar, economic pillars. 
If you do not have the economic okay. strength, Mr. Johnson, if you do not have the depth in politics and the depth of religion, you cannot weave a, an effective political strategy that eventually give you the kind of offices I, I, that I you're really looking wish, for. I really Don't honestly we wish that we had more there. time. Uh, Mr. Abali, I wish we had more time because there is so much um, I would have loved to uh, talk to you about when you talk about all the challenges that are up there. We should be looking at a way forward, but we don't have that time now. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your thoughts and experience on the program. Thank you. And of course, Gloria, a pleasure always to have you in our studios. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's Thanks my so pleasure. Well even though I didn't finish everything I wanted to say. Yeah, it's, ne <laughs> it's never enough time. I have you know. more questions for Mr. Abali, but uh, we don't have enough time. Thank you so much uh, for you coming. Thank you very It's pleasure. appreciated. We uh, yeah. would uh, take a short break. Uh, yeah. When we come back, of course, more on these uh, conversations um, all the way. Stay with us.